All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Nick Soko, one of the pediatric chief residents, um, and it's my pleasure to introduce our grand round speaker for today. Um, Dr. Julia Bayer is a tenured professor in the Department of Critical Care Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. As a practicing pediatric intensivist, she holds the UPMC chair in pediatric critical care medicine research. She's the founding director of the Children's Neuroscience Institute at UPMC Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. Dr. Bayer is an expert in the area of acute brain injury with a special emphasis in novel diagnostic and therapeutic approaches targeting oxygen derived cellular damage. Her work has provided fundamental insights into the link between oxidative stress, mitochondrial injury, and neuronal cell death. Her lab integrates the work of both clinical and basic science researchers. Dr. Bayer has over 180 papers in peer-reviewed journals, including uh, publications in Cell, Nature Neuroscience, Nature Chemistry, and the journal Clinical Investigation, among many others. Today, she'll be talking to us about the Children's Neuroscience Institute here at uh, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Um, so please join me in welcoming her today, and I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Bayer. Thank you so much for that very nice introduction. Um, and I'm excited to be here today with you discussing about the Children's Neuroscience Institute. Um, we have been doing this for so long, but I'm still requiring a little bit of time to share my screen. So hopefully it is this one. All right, are you seeing my slides or my notes? We see your notes. All right. Um, one more time. That looked good, Dr. Bayer. All right. That's that great. looks great. Okay, I just don't see any of my notes. Well, all right. I'm trying to find the laser pointer. All right. Again, thank you for joining us this morning uh, to learn about the Children's Neuroscience Institute, which is an incubator for pediatric neuroscience research, education, and patient care. The outline of the talk is on this slide. I will first talk about the Children's Neuroscience Institute, the goals, objectives, and organizational structure, the major research teams and cores, available programs for pilot funding and training through the Children's Neuroscience Institute. Then I will highlight um, the work done by our pilot projects, three pilot projects, and also highlight two clinical programs. And then we'll give you a, a small glimpse at the future in terms of molecular imaging that we have been doing. CNI uh, was established in July 2019. Uh, Dr. Dermody had a dream of initiating three different institutes at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, and one of them is Children's Neuroscience Institute, and I was infected with this uh, dream. Uh, the second one is Institute of Infection, Immunity, and Inflammation in Children, or I4Kids, and the third one is the Children's Community Health Center that includes the Pittsburgh study. The goals of Children's Neuroscience Institute are conducting cutting edge research that will provide a revolutionary mechanistic and translatable understanding of normal development and pathogenesis of neurological illness. Uh, discover innovative personalized therapies and imaging tools for neurologically ill or injured children. For example, personalized adoptive cell therapy trials, combination therapy vaccines, mass spectrometry imaging, and immunopet imaging. Enhance diagnosis of neurogenetic diseases and translate innovative ideas and concepts from bench to bedside. While there are um, thousands of neuroscience institutes in the world and in the US. Um, so how can we distinguish ourselves from all the existing neuroscience institutes? What is the research direction? How should we uh, 
point ourselves in the right direction. We thought that the research direction should be frontier and contemporary, should be unique and feasible, and it should stand on the strengths that we have at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. There are four disease areas we thought that we have significant strengths at Children's uh, leading the world in terms of research and translation. These are acute brain injury that include trauma, global and focal cerebral ischemia, shock, infection, and encephalopathy. Second one is in neurogenetic syndromes. Third one is in neuro-oncology. And the fourth one is self-learning clinical research platforms. In order to achieve our goals um, that we set forward in these disease processes, uh, we are focusing on several technologies and course. Uh, these are lipidomics and other omics-based technologies, computational tools for data analysis because the omics-based technologies generate lots of data that we need computational power to analyze them and make sense of them. The inducible pluripotent stem cell technology and uh, this technology driven precision therapies for neurogenetic diseases, precision based immunotherapy for CNS tumors, and as I mentioned, molecular imaging. You can read more about these technologies and course at our website at cnipittsburgh.pit.edu. When you go to our website, we see that how we're going to use these cores and technologies to discover, diagnose, and cure. This is our organizational structure. By design, is, it is an integrated network. You will see the members, research teams that are our backbone of our institute initiative. We have then partners that I will talk about them in a bit, and a big fundraising development in terms of the Children's Foundation and individual donors. Our website, you can see um, the members, our members, although probably they are so small on this slide, you can't read them. Um, you know, surely you will be able to uh, read their areas of interest and collaborate and contact them. We currently have 211 members. I want to have a big uh, shout out to our program manager, uh, Felicia Bender, who has been working tirelessly to develop this program with me. And also the executive advisory board members, Drs. Kohanek, Kagan, Dermody, Chu, and Yvette Bahar, as well as the associate directors, Dr. Bergman, Dr. Clark, Dr. Pollack, and Dr. Pende, and the core directors, Dr. Pende, Dr. Raja Sundaram and Dr. Wu. And uh, the last, our partners, uh, Safar Center uh, for Resuscitation Research, CHP Brain Care Institute, CHP Center for Rare Disease Therapy that are all located at Children's, as well as in the Pitt community, Pitt Brain Institute, Center for Biological Imaging, and McGee Women's Institute. Now I'm going to talk about our programs. Um, the first one will be directed towards research funding. The, uh, in, the, in terms of the research funding, it's a two-step process for application. Uh, there is a letter of intent and it's due on March 15 every year. The review is between March 15 and April 15 and invitation is in the week of 15 for the full application. Last, this year, we received 23 letter of intents and we invited six applications. The full uh, application is then reviewed by an uh, NIH style review. The earliest grant date is, uh, start date is July, 2021. It's a one year grant and you can see the uh, review criteria as well as how to put together your letter of intents, also the full application at our website. The research funding, um, we prioritize, we, uh, we like to have studies that are interdisciplinary in nature, that encourage innovative thinking, and applications are primarily reviewed based on their scientific merit, institutional research priorities, of course, the amount of money that we have. 
In terms of the seminars, we have currently six slots uh, of the uh, Rango Senior Research Seminar Series in 2020, 21. Uh, please send your recommendations for speakers to uh, Children's Neuroscience Institute at CNI Pittsburgh at pit.edu. Uh, in terms of the training, we currently have postdoctoral positions open. These positions are designed to provide cross-training in at least two disciplines. For example, one in omics, such as lipidomics, as well as bioinformatics. And we think that these align with what the science will require from these investigators in the future. Another area could be IPSC, inducible prepotent stem cell technology, as well as molecular imaging. We also participate in the programs offered at Rango's Research Center and programs offered at Pitt. And you can see the position details for these postdoc training opportunities, as well as um, the uh, links to the other programs that we participate. Now I'm going to go to the second part of this talk and we'll talk about the three projects, pilot projects that we funded in uh, this year, in 2020, 2021. There were three pilot applications from eight investigators that are shown on this slide. And I will briefly talk about all three of them. The first one is a study on the bench site. This study is trying to understand the mechanisms or how is it that we see cortical hypoperfusion after return of spontaneous circulation in cardiac arrest in children. It's targeting uh, vascular contractile cells in capillary stasis after cardiac arrest. And this uh, pilot was awarded to Dr. Mario, uh, Miora Manoli and Alberto Vasquez. This study uses the powerful technology of multifoton microscopy um, and also a model, a very unique clinically feasible and clinically relevant model of pediatric asphyxial cardiac arrest. As you know, majority of the cardiac arrest in children is asphyxial compared to the ventricular fibrillation that is seen in adult patients. As you see, they, um, the, this animal uh, is intubated, tracheally intubated, has venous and arterial catheters for blood draw and injection of resuscitative medications after the cardiac arrest. This objective is overlaid over the cortex and the depth of the, um, uh, of the examination can be as, high, as uh, much as 300 microns. So they can really see the cortical blood flow. This is... Um, What's happening in the next slide, we will be seeing in the after cardiac arrest and successful resuscitation. This is basically showing uh, the uh, circulating dextran compound, which is a fluorescently labeled compound in piled vessels, in penetrating vessels, and in the capillaries in the cortical area. After cardiac arrest, um, somehow the video is not playing. Oh, that's a bummer. Sorry, Mia, the videos, the beautiful videos are not playing. Um, after cortic, after uh, cardiac arrest and successful resuscitation, uh, there's a decrease in the uh, circulation. As I mentioned, there's hypoperfusion. And whether this is due to pile arterial or capillary uh, is a question. So at baseline, you see these very nice flow in the uh, pile arterioles. And post-cardiac arrest, there is a vasoconstriction in these piled arterioles. And the overlay, you can see that uh, there is, even if after 60 minutes after a successful resuscitation, there is piled arteriolar vasoconstriction. I don't know how to... Um... You just have to believe me in terms of uh, showing these videos that at baseline, you see uh, the very nice flowing of the uh, fluorescently labeled dextran. And then these areas that are um, black are red blood cells. And you see a very nice flow of the um, 
blood flow. Five minutes after successful resuscitation, you see these capillary stasis and red blood cells are almost not moving. And this is evident even at 30 minutes after resuscitation. Oh, okay, so now you're seeing it. Um, as I mentioned, there's a really dramatic capillary stasis of the red blood cells and other blood cells. So before cardiac arrest, there's very nice uh, flow in the pile arterioles and the capillary network. And there's after cardiac arrest and successful resuscitation, there's arteriolar constriction, capillary stasis. So how are they going to look at these cells, the smooth muscle contractile cells and the parasites, the contractile cells that are located very small in the capillaries. They're going to label these cells with a fluorescent marker and we'll use this NG2DS transgenic mice. And the plasma here is labeled in, in red and the smooth muscle cells and parasites are labeled with the green fluorescent uh, protein. And you can see, you can uh, differentiate based on the size. In the next slide, um, hopefully that will, this will, this is a normal, uh, this was another movie that is showing the um, blood flow and how these, the smooth muscle cells and uh, pile and the uh, parasites are giving the fluorescence under um, fluorescent microscopy. In their second aim, they're going to look at an intervention that relaxes these contractile vascular cells of the microcirculation, restoring normal cerebral perfusion after cardiac arrest. They will achieve this by inducing virally uh, inhibitory receptors in smooth muscles, cells, and parasites. And these receptors will be specifically activated either by a chemical agent, in this case, that's chemogenetics or light. As you see in this slide, these are uh, the designer receptors activated only by designer drugs are loaded onto these viral particles. And then this is injected into the brain. And then the chemical agent that will activate or inhibit this receptor is given to the uh, animal. It can be given for long-term studies orally or for acute studies IV. Uh, and then you can look at the uh, specific role that receptor plays in uh, the studies. The support from the CNI uh, helped Dr. Manoli and her team to garner an eight percentile on the first submission of their R21 at the NIH. So we are very pleased to hear this news and we continue and uh, we wish her good luck with the ongoing studies. The second study that I'm going to talk about, uh, the pilot, is uh, from bedside to bench with Gemin 5. It's establishing a new clinical entity, and the pilot project was awarded to a team of, the, uh, of uh, physicians and uh, scientists, Dr. Rajan, Dr. Pandey, and Dr. Kaur. The project actually stemmed from the neurogenetics clinic where the patients are seen. There is a next generation sequencing done in patients who have certain neurodevelopmental uh, symptoms. And from this next generation sequencing, they identified in about 30 patients uh, mutations in Gemin 5. These mutations, which I will show you, have functional consequences on the protein expression. Gemin 5 is an 170 kilodalton protein with distinct functional domains. It has a very important role in translational regulation of multiple genes, alternative splicing, and tumor cell motility. As I mentioned, they identified bioallelic variants in 30 patients with shared neurodevelopmental symptoms. So they're going to use uh, inducible pluripotent stem cells to help in novel drug discovery, as well as repurposing of already available FDA-approved drugs to help these patients in a way that is called precision medicine. You see in this slide, uh, the, um, the first part of this slide shows the affected patients in the family pedigrees. The variants in the Gemin 5, they cause developmental delay ataxia and motor dysfunction. And on the MRI of these patients, there is cerebellar hypoplasia. The uh, area in B shows the sequence alignment 
from different species, including humans, uh, mouse, dogs, and the rectangles that are red, those are the conserved sequences, suggesting that these sequences have important roles. They're not changing between species. And um, certainly the changes or variance in these might affect the function of this protein. They developed uh, to see whether the there is any functional consequence of loss of function for Gemin 5. They developed a model in flies, in Drosophila. Um, in Drosophila, the homolog of Gemin 5 is called rigor mortis. Using the RNA silencing technology, they silenced rigor mortis, Gemin 5. And you can see the mRNA expression of Gemin 5 uh, decreased more than 60%. And there was a severe late developmental defect with this amount of decrease in the mRNA expression. The, um, there was a delayed, uh, the ex explosion of uh, the fly were almost non-existent. And you can see the normal flies reached to the adulthood. In addition to um, that, the fly model, as I mentioned, they're also taking cells from affected patients and in the lab, developing inducible pluripotent stem cell derived neuronal cells. As you see in this slide, compared to a heterozygote in this variant for Gemin 5, the homozygote uh, carrying, variant carrying uh, patients have almost a complete loss of Gemin 5. You can see on this other example also that there is dramatic decrease in Gemin 5 expression when there is biallelic variants, uh, presence of biallelic variants. They also looked at other Gemin proteins because these proteins, combined action of Gemin proteins, as well as this spinal um, motor neuron protein, um, that together they play an important role in RNA translation. So you can see the effects of these Gemin 5 uh, biallelic variants also on Gemin 4, Gemin 2, UA1, and the SMN protein, which is well known for its causative effects in spinal muscular atrophy. As I mentioned, because of the role that Gemin 5 plans, plays in uh, RNA translation, it's the, the next, uh, they're looking at the whether the variants disrupt the expression of genes important for neuronal functions. And they have identified that the variants in Gemin 5 lead to disruption of synap uh, proteins important in synaptic transmission, cell cell adhesion, axon guidance, intracellular transport of synaptic vesicles, synaptic organization. Interestingly, one of the proteins is called GBX. It's a DNA binding transcriptional activator involved in axon guidance and cerebellar development. Uh, you will recall that there was cerebellar hypoplasia in these patients on the MRI. So that goes along with the function and structure. So this project is uh, identifying uh, and working on establishing the genotype and phenotype spectrum of this new disease related to Gemin 5. And it aims to understand the molecular mechanisms and modifiers with the goal to find therapeutic options for these patients. In the next project, we're going to move to the bedside. And this project is um, titled Whole Genome Sequencing to Identify Inborn Errors of Immunity in Critically Ill Children with Acute Encephalitis. The project uh, is, uh, the pilot is given to a team led by Dr. Kernan, and the team members include Dr. Dennis Simon, Deepa Rajan, and Kavita Takar. Encephalitis, as you know, is a disorder of brain inflammation cause, causing global CNS dysfunction. It has a high morbidity and mortality with very few directed therapies. The team thinks that there are host determinants of pathogenesis, and this is not completely understood in the case of encephalitis. They're doing daily screening of intensive care unit admissions, as well as neuro neurology service consultants in consultations at Children's Hospital. So far, there have been seven participants enrolled in this study. And uh, I've, I will show you some data from the preliminary analysis uh, that is uh, given by Dr. Kernan. 
The uh, patient population and methodology are listed in this slide. Uh, so they, do, those are the children with critically ill uh, in the ICU or in uh, neurology consultation service in the hospital. They have alteration in consciousness, cognition, personality, or behavior for more than 24 hours. And they have at least two of the following. Fever more than 38 degrees during the present illness, CSF pleocytosis, brain imaging consistent with encephalitis, seizures not fully attributable to a pre-existing seizure disorder, and new onset focal neurological signs. And as I mentioned, they're performing whole genome sequencing. And they're carrying a candidate gene approach to identify rare variants with previous evidence of pathogenicity using available sequencing databases. These are um, the five patients that have pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants. As I mentioned, there were seven patients and five of them, they identified these variants. And uh, the patient's clinical diagnoses were parainfectious, acute necrotizing encephalitis, or NMDA encephalitis, or fires, febrile infection-related epilepsy syndrome. And they find variants uh, that are uh, thought to be pathogenic or related to already known canonical disease states, such as common variable immunodeficiency, atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, congenital neutropenia, aplastic anemia, and autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome. In some of these disease states, there are emerging new therapies. So the overall goal would be for these patients to have, um, if they have uh, this variant and function coupling, to be able to use uh, these new therapies, offer at least a therapy to the uh, patients and parents. So we're going to illustrate two cases. The first case uh, is more of a positive control in this uh, case series. So it's a 20-year-old, uh, the patient is a 20-year-old uh, female with an ANA titer of um, a low ANA titer, one to 80. CSF analysis found consistent with NMDA receptor encephalitis. So it's an autoimmune mediated disease process. And the whole genome sequencing demonstrated autoantibody auto disease risk polymorphisms. Um, it has been shown that alternative complement plays key role in the pathogenesis of SLE and other autoantibody mediated diseases. The second case is uh, a febrile illness related encephalopathy. This is an 11 year old Caucasian female. Some of you might be familiar with this case who was in the ICU just recently, which is this patient has an interesting uh, phenotype, came in with seizures, uh, but she had very high levels of triglycerides in the range of a thousand. And the uh, whole genome sequencing demonstrated that she's a carrier for multiple variants affecting lipid metabolism and neurological function. For example, the CLN6 uh, variant that is implicated in epilepsy, as well as the CYP27A1, which is an important role in cholesterol and triglyceride metabolism. So this brings up the potential role for a pathogenic synergistic heterozygosity. Um, so how do these pilot projects, seminar series, and cores related to, uh, relate to our goals and objectives? I showed you in the, uh, one of the first slides was our goals and objectives. And as you see, uh, they were red, now they're in green. So they're really the, the projects and seminars are conducting cutting edge research. They are discovering new diseases and uh, they are leading the path for discovery of personalized therapies using different technologies. They're enhancing the diagnosis of neurogenetic diseases and uh, there's a bi-directional translation from bench to bedside and bedside to bench. So they are fulfilling our goals. And I'd like to thank, uh, I think maybe I forgot, but for the slides to Dr. Kernan, Dr. Rajan and Dr. Manoli. Next, I'm going to talk about 
two uh, clinical studies. There is a huge amount of great neuroscience uh, that is being conducted at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. I chose these two uh, because they are very clinically relevant and one of them is um, about COVID. So um, uh, I am sorry for the ones that I could not include in this talk, the studies. The first one we will talk about is a work by Dr. Christina Patterson from Neurology, Dr. Munjal and Dr. Simon from Critical Care Medicine. And it is about quantitative EEG and statistical machine learning for early detection of brain injury. This project's goals are to identify quantitative EEG metrics that define significant neurodeterioration and generate a quantitative EEG-based alert tool for the bedside clinicians. They're going to develop novel statistical and machine learning methods for automatic detection in real time. In this slide on the left side, you're looking at a seven second EEG view. And on the right side, uh, this is the um, transformed over 16 hours of EEG. When you look at this seven second EEG uh, screen, you can't really understand the big patterns, the patterns of EEG that are evolving over time. Dr. Patterson and her group are using, as I mentioned, machine learning to be able to tell us how these changes might be indicative of a neurological dysfunction. Here, you're looking at um, this technology uh, in real time, uh, detecting a uh, neurological deterioration. You see some changes uh, in this epoch in B. This is a patient, a seven-year-old, who is admitted with haemophilus influenza encephalitis. And uh, the detected clinical changes are here when the asymmetry is much more significant. And you see on the right upper right corner, the MRI of this patient showing middle cerebral artery occlusion. So let's look at this uh, in much more detail. So this is the baseline segment of EEG. And this area shows that there is an asymmetry between the left and right side on the EEG recording. And it is before, much before the changes that become apparent on a traditional EEG display and about 72 hours before the clinical change, which was a drop in the Glasgow Coma Scale score from 15 to 12. And then an MRI was ob ob obtained. And as I showed, it showed the uh, MCA occlusion. So uh, by doing this, um, the team, will develop an automated detection and alert system for both identification and prediction that can help prevent these types of catastrophic and nearly irreversible brain injuries. Well, we're in 2020 and uh, no talk is complete without talking about COVID-19. This is a scanning electron microscopy showing SARS-CoV-2 emerging from the surface of the cells. Our um, representative for the Global NeuroCOVID Initiative is Dr. Erica Fink, and she shared her slides with me. Um, in this slide, you uh, we're looking at the viruses and how they affect the uh, nervous system. Going from the left to right, uh, some of the viruses such as influenza, rabies, and enterovirus, they cause direct CNS infection with encephalitis and meningitis. Some of the other viruses, uh, they cause parainfectious syndrome. For example, influenza and Zika can lead to Guillain-Barre and acute disseminated encephalitis. Enterovirus 68 can lead to acute flaccid myelitis as well as um, other viruses causing transverse myelitis, hemorrhagic necrotizing encephalopathy. Many of the viruses can cause symptoms and conditions such as headache and, and uh, other symptoms and stroke in the case of varicella. For COVID-19, especially patients who have already a neurological disease such as multiple sclerosis in adults, one sees exacerbation of the neurological comorbidity. 
And of course, in the ICU, uh, especially after receiving sedation, um, having high inflammatory markers, a cytokine storm, as well as immobilization and steroids, we see treatment sequela that uh, now is called post-intensive care syndrome. There could be also uh, effect on muscle function. In this slide, uh, you, we're seeing a case series for COVID-19. Most of the patients, actually all of the patients with pediatric neurological manifestations of neuro-COVID are within the spectrum of MISC because MISC by uh, CDC criteria requires or includes the neurological manifestations. Uh, in the study from France, uh, they identified that 31% of the patients had meningismus. In all these series, you see that there is increase in inflammatory markers, including IL-6, CRP, and ferritin. In some of them, there's also increase in D-dimer, suggesting there's microangiopathy and thrombosis. Overall, the patients, um, the mortality is low. The other neurological signs and symptoms are irritability, headaches, confusion, and meningismus. There was only one case with anosmia. In these series, uh, the neurological manifestations were not um, consistently reported or looked at. So more in-depth analysis and uh, um, review of these studies or cases are, are coming. Uh, patients were mostly given IVIG steroids uh, or plasma exchange. And in one study, they also received anakinra. Um, the Great Ormond Street reported a series of patients, uh, children with MISC and CNS and uh, PNS, peripheral nervous system involvement. These patients uh, also showed uh, changes in mental status, irritability, headaches, and uh, on imaging on the T2 and DWI, they show changes uh, in splenium. And uh, the pathophysiology is thought to be a release of the IL-1 and IL-6 from macrophages, recruitment of T cells, blood brain, blood brain barrier breakdown, activation of astrocytes, release of glutamate from these activated astrocytes and water influx into astrocytes and neurons leading to cytotoxic edema. There's always, of, of course, talk about the direct uh, invasion of um, CNS by the SARS-CoV-2. Um, the receptors, ACE2 receptors are available uh, on endothelium as well as the dendritic cells and macrophages and in organotropic um, cultures from IPSC, from humans, you can also see uh, presence and um, expression of these receptors. Why is splenium? One of the thoughts is that, uh, that there was a lot of change in splenium on the MRI. Uh, it's because of the high density of glutamate receptors uh, in splenium uh, might be related to that. This um, slide shows the GCS NeuroCOVID consortium. Uh, there are 103 pediatric sites over in 26 countries, and they're doing three-tier studies looking at prevalence of neurological manifestations and outcomes in hospitalized children with COVID-19 and MISC. Tier two studies are looking at post-discharge function, health-related quality of life, symptoms, healthcare utilization, and family impact. And three tier three studies are looking at hypothesis-driven um, probing the pathophysiology of COVID-19 on neurological injury to the developing brain. Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh has um, two representatives, Dr. Erica Fink in the Pediatric Steering Committee, as well as Dr. S uh, Dennis Simon in the working groups for tier three. Another Pitt critical care alumni, Dr. Cho, is also in uh, involved in the GCS NeuroCOVID consortium. 
Um, so now I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the future and give you a glimpse of the new molecular imaging technologies that we are developing in the last uh, couple minutes. So the molecular imaging uh, can help us understand the normal neurodevelopment. It can also help understanding the mechanism of injury and delineate um, therapeutic targets in the disease processes that I highlighted as our focus disease processes, including acute CNS injuries, infections and inflammatory CNS diseases, brain tumors, and neurogenetic diseases. Most of you are familiar with fluorescent imaging and optical imaging. Um, one of the new kids on the block for imaging is mass spectrometry imaging. Why is it different than the other imaging technologies? Because you do not need any probes or any tags to image molecules uh, using mass spectrometry imaging. Unfortunately, it's not an in vivo technique. So you need tissue for mass spectrometry imaging. Uh, but it gives unprecedented detail in terms of the molecular structure and subcellular structure uh, on the tissues. On this slide, you're looking at a technology called secondary ion mass spectrometry. In secondary ion mass spectrometry, highly focused gas clusters of ion beams are bombarded on the tissue section. These are usually uh, carbon dioxide are water clusters, and there are thousands of clusters accelerated at 80 kilovolt, uh, kilovolt to initiate uh, ionization of these molecules from the tissue section. And uh, this is mounted on a mass spectrometer. The ionized, the ions are collected by the analyzer, uh, the mass spectrometer, and then sent for data acquisition. These beams are capable of desorbing intact molecular ions from biological surfaces with a lateral resolution of less than one micron and a depth resolution in the order of 10 nanometers. So you can create a three-dimensional chemical information from uh, this imaging technology. On this slide, you're, we're showing, I'm showing you uh, the imaging of some of the phospholipids on brain tissue uh, using SIMS technology. In A, you look at, you're looking at the neurons labeled with fluorescent microscopy using fluorescently labeled antibodies for NUN, which is in green, and for GFAB, which is in red. That's a glia uh, astrocyte, and that's a neuron. This checkerboard here is showing the um, heated map, so 100% or so 0%, the red dots, red squares here are the 100%, very high amount of a, a given phospholipid molecule. You can have an image for each phospholipid molecule or a metabolite that you're interested uh, at the subcellular level. When we overlay the mass spectrometry imaging with the fluorescent imaging, now we can see the um, amount, the intensity of different lipid molecules in this uh, different cells in astrocytes and in neurons. It is, as I mentioned, you can have these maps for more than 150 different molecules. Another technique uh, that's used for looking at cellular distribution of proteins is called mass cytometry. In this case, a tissue or cell line uh, is stained with metal-labeled antibodies. Uh, as you know, in fluorescent microscopy, because of the uh, fluorescent spectra of the tags, you can at the most use four different uh, colors for fluorescent microscopy. And in flow cytometry, similarly, the numbers of antibodies that you can use are limited. But here in mass cytometry, uh, the chemistry is helping us to identify close to 100 proteins or protein modifications. How is this done? It is done using the rare earth metals such as lanthanides and their iso isotopes. So these, antibi these antibodies are tagged with different isotopes of lanthanides. And then uh, there's laser ablation 
coupled with the mass, mass spectrometry detection of these lanthanide isotopes. One drag or one downside to this kind of imaging is that these cells still need to be dis dissociated and um, given through a capillary. And so the tissue architecture is lost, especially for disease states such as tumors or contusion. It's very important to understand what's happening around the area of interest in, around the tumor or around the contusion. So we set is how can we then image metabolites, lipids, and proteins in a cell-specific manner on the same tissue section without really disturbing the tissue architecture? So we are using currently a secondary ion mass spectrometry with lanthanide tagged antibodies. This is a regular hematoxyl and eosin image looking at a ductal carcinoma and we're imaging this area in the blue rectangle. And here you're looking at the water beam um, enabled imaging of phospholipids, different metabolites and fatty acids. Here the PI, uh, the, are, these are phosphatidyl inositol molecules that are in purple. The lysophosphatidyl ethanolamines are in green, and that's much more in the ductal carcinoma. And it's thought to be one of the uh, markers for invasive carcinoma. We can also look at different metabolites, including glucose, uh, glutathione, AMP, and others, and individual fatty acid molecules, such as arachidonic acid, or the cosaexonic acid and adrenic acid and others. Then using these lanthanide tag, tagged antibodies on the same tissue section, so in this rectangle, we can then tag uh, proteins that label different cells. For example, an anti-human CD68 that labels monocyte lineage. We can label uh, cells that are highly pro proliferating using anti-KI67. We can uh, label histones. Uh, so to look at the intracellular or subcellular distribution of our molecules. And this is using a different um, gun. So it's using the carbon dioxide C60 secondary ion mass spectrometry. And using different uh, bioinformatics tools such as OPLSDA, we can then differentiate what is actually the most prominent metabolite using the metabolite signature, differentiate the cells and look at the distribution of uh, the metabolized proteins, lipids in these different cell types and intracellular areas. So our ongoing work is looking at depth erosion to look at the intracellular organelles, for example, inner and outer mitochondrial membrane composition, spatial distribution of metabolites, lipids, and proteins. We're working on correlational imaging using SIMS and high resolution fluorescent microscopy and scanning electron microscopy and looking at an analysis of biological phenomenon, for example, switches between different regulated cell death pathways in cells, such as necroptosis and ferroptosis, and changes in the polarization of microglia. Um, this is, we're coming to the end of uh, the uh, grand rounds on CNI. Uh, if you're not already a member, please visit our website at cnipittsburghpit.edu and click on the membership link. Um, some of the membership, ben membership benefits include uh, neuroscience, access to the neuroscience newsletter, finding funding opportunities, interdisciplinary collaborations. We have newsletters that uh, you will be getting and we can highlight also your work. Please send us important publications, grants that you obtained. And I'd like to thank all our members uh, that, are, uh, that um, are on our website, as well as you for listening, tuning in this morning, and um, happy to answer questions. Thank you so much um, for that really wonderful presentation. I think it was really interesting to see sort of the diversity of projects that you all have going on. Um, 
I didn't know a lot about a lot of that. And so it was really wonderful to learn about that work. Um, so if folks have questions, you're more than welcome to type them into the Q&A section. Um, and we'll take those as they come in. And then just as a reminder, we'll also have the meet and greet session at nine as well for some additional time for questions. Um, so we'll give folks just a couple of seconds here to put any questions that they have. Um, so great, a question from Dr. Dermody in the chat. Um, so great talk, Julia. You and your colleagues are doing wonderful work in the CNI. I have a question about the second pilot project. Would you speculate on future treatment options for children with um, Gemin 5 mutations? Could these conditions be treated with gene therapy or do you anticipate some type of small molecule approach? That's a great question. Thank you, Dr. Dormady. Um, I think using the IPSC, I think that that's a really powerful technology and you can screen uh, in a patient specific way, what will work for those cells. And um, you can look at the FDA approved molecules uh, that are uh, using the Drug Discovery Institute tools, for example, and look at the FDA approved medications as well as gene therapy. And the strength that team has is not only they have the patient drived neurons or ne neuron set, neuronal cells, but they also have animal models, flies and also mice. So uh, they can then graduate these treatments uh, to animal models as well before, if it is, for example, a new treatment that you can graduate them from cells to uh, animals and then to humans. But if it is FDA approved and has a low safety profile, why not? I think that parents at least will be interested in hearing about these treatments and they will be really supportive of this kind of uh, research and this kind of effort that our investigators are doing. There was a recent study in New England Journal of Medicine with an N of one using a very similar approach. So they had a one patient, a, a, a patient sample size of one in New England Journal of Medicine using this type of technology treating a neurogenetic syndrome with genetic um, means. So much. So we'll give folks a couple more seconds for any um, final questions. Perfect. Um, so another follow-up question from Dr. Dermody. Um, so in the third project, um, has the team identified any patients with documented infectious, um, not post-infectious encephalitis? Um, and if so, any interesting sequence polymorphisms? Mm. Um, no, I think that that's a Another great question. Uh, the that project initially stemmed from um, actually a, not a frustration, but a, a kind of challenge that we have um, with these patients. We do million dollar workup and um, we do not find in some of these very challenging cases a reason. Uh, we can find, identify a virus not in necessarily in the CSF. We can identify it in the nasopharynx, um, but um, it's not usually, you know, the thought process is not, it's not the case, for example, just regular coronavirus. So, but I think that uh, getting this, opening this into the, also the infectious or the viral and, and uh, pathogen directed encephalitis and meningitis or, or mediated where we identify a pathogen will be really interesting. And in those patients who have these severe manifestations such as encephalitis, meningitis, one might expect actually more of a pathogenic variant burden. So that's a great point. Currently the assays I think um, are the, the limiting factor is the budget. So hopefully we will be able to generate more funding for these types of um, analysis. Great, well, um, there are no further questions. Um, just wanna echo all the comments in the chat, really just such a great discussion. Um, so grateful for your time, um, Dr. Bayer, and um, we can invite folks to sort of transition over to the meet and greet um, starting at 9 a.m. Um, to have a little bit more time for this discussion. So thanks so much.
Thank you for inviting me.